uh, from Isaiah 44, which is basically going to tell you the sermon again. That's not the sermon. Don't worry about it. Then I will talk to you about the sermon. And then we're going to hear from Holy Spirit what he's saying to us specifically about this whole topic. I've put the almost all the notes on this little sheet of paper, so you don't have to worry about taking screenshots or writing fast. There's a bunch on the uh, uh, way in if you want to grab it. There is one that's missing. I'll tell you now that one is missing because it came after I did those up and it was like, oh, and even sitting there today, I thought, oh, I'm going to change that and use that differently. But anyway, this, this all works out good. So I want to read from Isaiah 44, and this is God comforting his people through the prophet Isaiah. I, Isaiah was prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. And for 39 chapters, that's what he does. Then chapter 40, God says, comfort, comfort my people. And from chapter 40 on, for the most part, he's comforting his people. I want you to hear these words in chapter 44. If you've got time this week, read the whole chapter. I'm going to skip around, not skip around. I'm going to skip a hunk in the middle uh, just for time's sake, but it's still really good. And you might, uh, God will speak to you through it. But Isaiah 44 says, but now listen to me, Jacob, my servant. Israel, my chosen one, the Lord who made you, helps you, says, Don't be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, O dear Israel, my chosen one. For I will pour out water to quench your thirst, to irrigate your parched fields. And I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. And they will thrive like watered grass, like willows on the river bank. Some will proudly proclaim, I belong to the Lord. And others will say, I am a descendant of Jacob. Some will write the Lord's name on their hands and will take the name of Israel's as their own. This is what the Lord says, Israel, King's Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. There's no other God who is like me. Let him step forward to prove to you his power. Let him do what I have done since ancient times when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. I did not proclaim. Did I not proclaim my purpose for you long ago? You are witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. Pay attention, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I, the Lord, made you, and I will not forget you. I have swept away your sins like a cloud. I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. O oh, return to me, for I have paid the price to set you free. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done this wondrous thing. Shout for joy, O depths of the earth. Break into song, O mountains and forests and every tree. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and is glorified in Israel. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer and Creator. I am the Lord who has made all things. I alone have stretched out the heavens. Who was with me when I made the earth? I exposed false prophets as liars and make fools to, to, of fortune tellers. I tell the wise to give bad advice, thus proving them to be fools. But I carry out the predictions of my prophets. By them I say to Israel, people will live here again. And to the towns of Judah, you will be rebuilt. I will restore your ruins. The people of Israel were in for a long haul. Jerusalem would be destroyed. They would be taken away for captivity. But God wanted to encourage them. His plan was to prosper them and not to harm them. His plan was to give them a hope and a future. And Isaiah was encouraging them so they could trust their maker through the tough stuff. It's been a long haul for us. We've all had to cope. We've had to deal with the reality that we've been faced with. You know how to hope, but do you know how to thrive? Last time I spoke, I reminded you of how we can hope at all times and in every situation. The acronym is HOPE. I want you to hold on to testimony, operate in reality, pour out your heart to God, and engage your whole heart with hope. 
And if you missed that message, it's Can My Weary Soul Rejoice Again? It's on our website. You can check it out. But as I, 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 I really feel God's given me a word for 2022. And surprisingly, that word isn't hope. The word is thrive. And I don't believe that it's all going to be sunshines and rainbows. I don't believe it's, it's, I do believe the challenge for me is to thrive. So in spite of anything, I can have joy, I can have peace, I can have hope at all times and in every situation. What does it mean to thrive? I believe to thrive means that I have peace and hope and joy at all times and whatever happens. I figure that's a good definition for thriving. It, it's part of the kingdom. The kingdom, it's part of bringing the kingdom to earth. The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul starts out at Romans, and Peterson translates chapter 1, verse 16 to 17 this way. He says, uh, it's news that I'm most proud to proclaim, this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts in him, starting with the Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith confirming what Scripture has said all along. The person who is in right standing before God by trusting Him really lives. Are you ready to really live? Has it been a while since you felt like you've really lived? Guess what? Your standing with God has never changed. It's not Him that has moved away. You might feel like it's been a while since you've really lived. And today, I want you to help. I want to help you so your feelings line up with the truth that God has never left you or forsaken you. God's desire for you is to have hope and a future. He wants you to thrive no matter what happens, no matter what situation you're going through, no matter what you face as we face or what you face individually. How does that, you know, we're made for so much more than just to survive. We were made to thrive. How does that song go by Casting Crowns? It's joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, God unstoppable, everything is possible. You we're created to walk with God in the garden of the cool of the day. And sin came into the world and you bore the consequences. Jesus came and took your place and offered you his yoke that is easy and his burden that is light. You're a child of God. Creation longs to be revealed. You're a living light. Don't, tra don't conform, but be transformed so you can have peace and joy and hope at all times and in every situation. Today I'm going to show you, share with you the how to thrive tool. When God gave me this word, I had to know how, it, how can I thrive? How can I thrive? And as I studied the word, this is what he gave me. In order to thrive, I need to tune into Holy Spirit. I need to be, have an honest, be honest in my reflection. I need to rest and be renewed. I need to ignite my spiritual fervor. I need to victoriously live, and I need to embrace who God says I am. We just saying all this stuff. Right? Let's start with tuning into Holy Spirit. Tune into Holy Spirit. Galatians five twenty five says, "Since we're living in the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives." How do you do that? The rest of the chapter, Paul is explaining how we follow the Spirit in every part of our lives. He tells us, uh, the acronym I've come up with it for this is HUMBLE, okay? Uh, it's all out of Galatians 5. The H stands for we need to hope in His promise. 
Uh, verse 5 tells us we need to wait patiently to receive his promises. You means we need to understand that faith expresses itself in love. Uh, verse 6 says the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. We need to maintain M, maintain the freedom by serving others in love. Uh, I forget what verse 13 says, but it is serve, <laughs> serve others in love. B is to ban what is in the sinful nature, what the sinful nature craves. Uh, verse 16 actually tells us to crucify the passions and desires that war against our spiritual nature. Um, L is to let the fruit of the Spirit grow. Verse 22, we um, really can't stop the fruit growing. Uh, but we can get in the way, right? We can choose not to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. We can't stop it if we're in the Spirit. That's what grows in us. It's not that it's work for us. It's work for us to not grow that way. Um, and anyway, the E in humble is that you enjoy peace with others. Verse 26, as you follow the Spirit's leading, you are at peace with everyone as long as it depends on you. Actually, that's not what it says, but look it up. You got the notes. That's what Paul tells the Galatians it means to keep in step with the Spirit. How have you been doing that? How have you been doing doing that? Do you hope in his promise? Do you understand its faith expressing itself in love? Do you maintain freedom by serving others in love? Do you ban what the sinful nature craves? Do you let the Spirit grow in you? Do you enjoy peace with others? Is that your experience? What would Holy Spirit say if you took the time to ask him? Am I keeping in step with you? So to thrive, we need to remember to be humble so we can tune into Holy Spirit we also, I also need to be honest in my reflection. Proverbs 28, 18 says, to Those whose walk is blameless uh, is kept safe, but those whose ways are perverse fall into the pit. Basically, what in the context in Proverbs, it's talking about being honest. And uh, when you're honest, you're kept safe. In order to thrive, we need to be honest in three ways. One, we need to be honest with ourselves. Uh, basically, we need to admit when we're struggling. We need to be honest with those around us. Basically, it means we need to be vulnerable when we need help. Um, and we have to be okay if they're not in a place to offer help to. Right? Part of vulnerability is allowing them not, not prescribing how they have to carry your burden for you. Like, I'm supposed to carry your burdens. You're not to tell me how I'm supposed to carry your burden. That's not part of the plan. Uh, and third, we need to be honest with God. And I talked about this last time. It's lament. We have to be confident enough to pour out our heart to God. We have to know, like, read the Psalms. They are full of prayers of, God, why have you forgotten me? God's okay with us accusing him of forgot, forgetting us, even though he says, I will never forget you. He's okay with us having those emotions and having those feelings because he wants to heal those emotions and heal those feelings. Or, oh, you, to be honest with God. And pra, uh, um, too often, too often, as Christians, I find we, we aren't honest with ourselves because it's like, how can God ever offend us? You know, we're, he's the potter, we're the clay. How can we say anything about him? And yet we withdraw from him. And yet we, we pull away from, from his presence. And yet we start judging his word by how we think it should be. We can be offended at God and never be honest enough to actually admit it. But if we're going to thrive, we have to be able to say, God, I'm feeling offended at you. Uh, then comes confession and repentance. That's how you fix feeling offended at God. I don't want to feel offended at you, God. Show me how I cannot feel these things. 
We need to praise him in the storm, yes. We need to praise him before the battle won, yes. We need to praise him before the answer comes. And when we do it with gratitude, it's a great game changer. It does change our attitude when we do it with gratitude. Uh, Psalm 103 says, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. But we can't put on a plastic face mask. We can't pretend everything's all right when it's not all right. We need to be able to go to God and go to others and say, listen, I need help. If others can't help you, with a lot of times we can't. But God can and will. Are you honest in your reflection? Do you turn from his gaze? What would Holy Spirit tell you if you would take the time to ask him? So to thrive, I need to tune into Holy Spirit. I need to be honest in my reflection. I need to be, and then third, I need to rest and be renewed. You got to see this Psalm, Psalm 126. <laughs> it's useless to work so hard from morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Ouch. What is rest? Well, you got to see what Isaiah says about rest. Isaiah 30. He's starting at verse 15. He says, This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quiet confidence is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will get our help from Egypt. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle, but your only swiftness you are going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. What? Have you been trusting in horses and trusting in chariots? Or have you been trusting in the name of the Lord your God? What does rest mean? This one is not in your notes. Take a screenshot or write quickly. Rest is relying on God to finish what he started. It is engaging in his rhythm of praying and obeying. What did Jesus do? He often went to lonely places to pray. He only did what he saw the Father do. He only said what he heard the Father say. You get that? It's, it's, he had this rhythm, and that needs to be our rhythm. If we want to thrive, we need to be with God, and we need to be doing what God tells us to do. We need to be with God, and we got to be saying what God tells us to say. It's not work. It is rest to spend time with God and only do what he says. It's work to do what everyone else thinks you should be doing and everything you think other people think you should be doing. I got that right. You women listen to me because you guys are really good at that. Doing what you think other people think you should be doing. I do think us guys have it easy that way because we could care less. Anyway, um, so you engage in his rhythm of praying and obeying. S is you steward what he's entrusted to you. When you rest, you still got to take care of what God's entrusted to you. If that's your kids, you got to make sure you take care of your kids. That's rest. If it's your spouse, if it's your loved one, if it's your parents, if it's your neighbor, it's, it's rest to take care of who God has entrusted to you. What God has entrusted to you. A lot of times rest is is developing your gifts and your ability and your talent. If it's writing, learn to write. Write a million words before you publish. Like, get it out there. If it's doing videos up, do those videos up. Keep on doing them, and, and you get better and better. Rest is, is stewarding what he's entrusted to you. And rest is T, thanking him for what he's done and is doing and not worrying about what's left undone. Posted a picture. We're we're getting ready to move, and I posted a picture of my office in boxes. And I had a friend 
whose son is teaching me to do the Rubik's Cube, say, I notice your Rubik's Cube is undone. And, and I texted her, or I put her back, and I commented back, you know, it's like I've, I've learned to look at what's done and not what's left undone. Because her son is trying to teach me, but I, um, I just like to fidget with those things. I don't care if they get done. But anyway, rest is not sitting on your hands. Rest is not waiting for God to do what he's already told you to do. If he's told you to do it, if he's told you in the book to do it, if he's told you, impressed upon you in your spirit to do it, do it. Don't wait for him to be doing it. Are you resting? Rest is ultimately trust. Rest is trust. The one that I'm working on, I will preach on this later sometime, but trust, I really, I, I'm learning what trust is. How do you grow trust between people and how do you grow trust with God? Uh, and it's turning out in my study, it's the same thing. How we grow trust with people is how we grow trust with God. I'm, I'm guessing. I still got to flesh it out. But one of the hints is I grow in trust by the test uh, um by testimony and and the prophecies over my life if i can remember what god has done before for myself or other people if i can remember the prophetic words those words that have given me encouragement and life if i can remember those and steward those well when you get a prophetic word over your life it's not Put it on the shelf and wait to see if it happens. That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, you test everything and hold to the good. So if you have a per prophetic word over your life that, that's there, you do what you can to make sure that comes about. God will, God will work it out however he wants to work it out. That's his part. Your part is to steward the gifts that you have to make sure that that works out. So if he if he's prophesied over you that you're going to see the dead raised, start praying for sick people. Start chasing ambulances and see if anyone needs it. I don't know, whatever God leads you into, but wait till it's warmer and wait till you, you know. Might be a little awkward during COVID, but anyway. Um, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. All, and... All who are weary and carry a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I do believe that rest is our responsibility, but I acknowledge that rest comes from Jesus. My responsibility is to uh, take up his yoke and learn from him. I learn his rhythms. I learn his leading. I learn by obeying him, what he tells me to do. Rest, so rest is our part. Restoration or renewal is God's part. God's the one who renews us. He renews us in five ways, in case you're counting. There might be more. I found five ways. God renews my strength. He renews my soul. He renews my willing spirit. He renews my mind. And he renews my knowledge of God. And we got time for me to read those verses. So, my strength. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings of eagle, like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. My soul, Psalm 23, 3, he leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. My willing spirit, Psalm 51, 10 to 12. Creating me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of, joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. My mind, Romans 12, 2. Don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. My knowledge of God, Colossians 3.10, having put in, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of, of its creator. Your job is to rest or learn from Jesus so you can rest, so he'll give you rest. His job is to renew. Are you giving yourself space to rest and be renewed? Are you pushing through and keep on going? If, can I tell you that what I see in the world around me right now, when people feel out of control, so what I see in the world around me is people do all they can to control whatever they can control. That means customer service is out the window because I'm going to control this. That means it, it, it's, it blows me away. I, I see it and I've learned just to give people space and not get offended that they're acting so... Anyway... The answer is not to try to control when you feel out of control. The answer is to rest. Learn from Jesus how to rest and let God renew you. Are you resting in him? Are you inviting him to renew you? What would Holy Spirit say if you took the time to ask? So to thrive, I need to tune into Holy Spirit. I need to be honest in my reflection. I need to rest and be renewed. And I, I need to ignite my spiritual fervor. This is from the NIV, Romans 12, 9 to 17. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is in the, right in the eyes of everyone. How do you ignite your spiritual fervor? How do you naturally do these things? These things don't work if I make them a checklist and I try to live them out. They don't work as a measuring stick to say, oh, I don't have enough of God in me because I can't do this or I can't do that or I'm not doing that. that they don't work that way. They work as we respond to what God is doing in our life. How? Do you renew, ignite your spiritual fervor? Oh, let me show you this story, Revelation 2. This is a, we need to hear this story loud and clear. Revelation 2, this is Jesus speaking to the uh, church in Ephesus. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. This is the message from him who holds the seven stars in his right hand to the one who walks among the seven golden lamps lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people and examine the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars and you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other the way you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the work you did at first. If you don't repent, you will, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. The church in Ephesus did everything right. They had the right theology. They were able to examine those that were not right. But in their struggle and in their part of what they went through, in their trouble, they forgot their first love.
they're the only one of the churches that Jesus threatened to remove the lampstand. Basically, he was telling them, I will snuff you out because you are not doing what I want you to do. We hear of churches closing over COVID. I, yeah, I'm sad for some, but I know there's a lot of churches that need to close. Because they're not doing what God tells them to do. And honestly, that's a warning for us, church. If we're not doing what God tells us to do, we should close the doors. Because we are His light. And if we're not shining His brightness, if we're just doing what we want to do or how we want to do it, Honestly, it's better for you to meet in your homes with people of like minds that you can encourage and be emboldened by than it is to come and join together and keep the lights on in this place. And if that's what we've been doing, the answer is right here. The answer is repent and do the things we did at first. How do you ignite your spiritual fervor? Your spiritual fervor is doing those things you did at first. What, how was your faith most thriving? When your faith was most thriving, what were the things you were doing? Sometimes that's when you're first a brand new Christian. For some of us who became a Christian when we're really young, it's when we first encountered Holy Spirit. Or maybe it's a secondary time when we encountered Holy Spirit. Or maybe it was another time. But there was a time in your life when you were thriving more than you're thriving today. What were you doing? Were you in the, in the Word? Were you spending a lot of time in prayer? Were you overwhelmed with love for others? Were you praying in the Spirit? Were you, were you seeing the Spirit move through you in signs and wonders and healing? Whatever you were doing that you knew was God's will for you to do and you've stopped doing it, guess what? You repent. And you do the things you did at first. Now, the good news is Holy Spirit empowers you to accomplish every good work prompted by faith. So it's Holy Spirit at work in you. It's not you whipping yourself into form. It's not you self-flagellating so that God will see you in some way. No, it is repenting and asking Holy Spirit to empower you to do what He's told you to do. God, this, this, the wonderful thing about this Bible is, is it's, the more you're in it, the more you want to be in it. But the reverse is true. The less you're in it, the less you want to be in it. So if it's dusty on your shelf, pick it up, repent, get in the book. If your prayer life isn't what you know it should be, repent and get your prayer life back to where it should be. Now, I'm not saying there aren't seasons in life. What am I saying with that? When our kids were small, it was harder to do some things. Uh, I don't have any kids in the home now. I can basically do whatever I want to do if Karen doesn't want me to do something else. I don't have any excuses now. You might have excuses. But find a way to work around those things that need to get done, those things that God has entrusted to you, those people God has entrusted to you. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. James 4, 7, and 8 says, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Is your loyalty divided between God and the world? Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he will have mercy on them. Yes, to our God, for he will forgive. To thrive, you need to have that first love for God and that his love for others. Can you look God in the eye? Can you spend time alone with him in silence? You need to ask Holy Spirit if you're living offended at him. What would Holy Spirit say if you took the time to ask? We go through the motions and our goal is simply to cope. Oh, we can easily pull away from God. When 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 our our we just want to survive. We just we just want to get through this. Really living, really thriving, really being able to call others to life. It just, it, it's not there anymore. The good news is, when you confess and repent, he will draw near to you. He will bring it back. I want to thrive. I need to tune into Holy Spirit. I need an honest reflection, honest in my reflection. I need to rest and be renewed. I need to ignite my spiritual fervor. And V, I need to victoriously live. Oh. When we're in survival mode, we often forget that there's power in the blood of Jesus. We we face trials and difficulties. We may think that they'll last forever. And sometimes, like this whole situation, it goes on way too long. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 8. What shall I say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares to accuse us for uh, whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who will then condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it no, mean that we know he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or in danger or are threatened with death? As Scripture says, For your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. No, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do you stand victorious? How do you live victorious? For me, it's the word stand. I got to stand. What does that mean? It means I stop giving God credit for the works of the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It means I treat all hardship as discipline, knowing that he will work all things together for good. It means I agree to cast all my cares upon him because he cares for me. It means I will never be lacking in zeal, but keep my spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I'll be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. By the way, when I'm faithful in prayer, it's easier easier to be joyful in hope and patient in affliction. I can I can do the prayer thing with Holy Spirit's help. And the D is I don't worry about anything. I pray about everything. I thank Him in all things, knowing that he, that's His will for me. Are you living victoriously? 
Are you ready to thrive and not merely survive? What would Holy Spirit impress upon you if you took the time to ask? So to thrive, I know I need to tune into Holy Spirit. I need an honest on be honest in my reflection. I need to rest and be renewed. I need to ignite, ignite my spiritual fervor. I need to victoriously live, and E, I need to embrace who God says I am. First Corinthians sixteen or six nineteen and twenty. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of Holy Spirit, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. The only opinion that really matters to me about me is God's opinion. It has to be the same way for you. I know I need to take thoughts captive. I need to tear down strongholds. I, I can't let any thought that disagrees with what God says about me in this book take precedence over what God says about me in this book. I need to erase shame and I need to embrace grace. How do I erase shame? I need to believe when the book says, if I confess with my mouth, no, not, not that one. It, when the book says, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, give me my sins. I need to believe that. If, if I, it doesn't feel like I've been forgiven, I don't need to forgive myself. That's not in the book. What I do need to do is repent of the sin of unbelief. The Bible talks about unbelief and it talks about it being a sin. I don't believe what God says about himself in forgiving me. If I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin. He doesn't hold it against me anymore. I can't hold it against myself. If I don't feel like I've been forgiven, it is the sin of unbelief. Confess and repent of that. If I sin, I should feel guilt. If I confess that sin, I should not feel shame. I should never feel shame for sin that I've confessed and repented of. You are washed, you are cleansed, you are made right before God. There's no shame in your game. I also, I need to erase shame. I also need to embrace grace. What is grace? Grace is God's supernatural enabling to do what he tells me to do. He empowers me to accomplish every good work prompted by faith. So to thrive, I need to erase shame and I need to embrace grace. Do you embrace who God says you are? We sing about it and it feels good when we sing about it. But what happens the next time someone sets that thing that triggers us, triggers shame in us? I'm going to give you some time to hear what Holy Spirit says about you. Maybe that's a question you want to ask. God, do I need to erase shame? Do I need to embrace? I don't believe that the year to come will be all sunshine and rainbows, but I do know God's will for me personally is that he wants me to thrive and have peace and joy and hope at all times and in every situation. Look at what Proverbs 29 says. It says, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. 
When the wicked are in power, they groan. We'll leave that one out. But when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. You're the righteous. Are you ready to thrive? Will you tune into Holy Spirit? Will you be honest in your reflection? Will you rest and be renewed? Will you in, in, ignite your spiritual fervor? Will you victoriously live and will you embrace who God says you are? I, I don't want to leave here and hear people say, boy, you put a lot into that sermon. It's going to take me a while to unpack. Yeah, I did. I gave you notes. Study it. It's good for you. I, I want to hear people say, I want you to say that you, you heard from God. And we got time here, so we're going to take time. We're not going to take a long time, but we're going to make a moment. And we're going to create space for you to hear from God. Now, if you've got a pen and paper, you might want to ask God a question and then write down how you think he's responding. If you've got a phone, I don't have my phone. got a phone, maybe you make a note and ask God a question and write down how you think he's responding. Maybe you just want to sit there and just sit in his presence and ask God and just wait for him to respond. And, and you might, I don't think, well, I... I've heard the audible voice of God once. Every other time, it's been an impression. So don't expect God to speak audibly. But if he does, whoa, you're, yeah, pay attention. But if it's, it's, just a, it's just a deeper knowing, it's something that he impresses on you. It could be anything that we talked about today that God wants you, he either wants to really encourage you in it, where he tells, he wants you to confess and repent, and then he'll encourage you in it. Because this is not a time, you will not feel shame. You will feel freedom. You, when you hear from God, it brings you to life. It ignites something in you when you hear his voice. So I'm going to ask them to put on the, the, the video. It's going to play. I'm going to pray and just give us a time to have a moment. And I don't know how long, it, it won't be too long, but it will be a moment. And then I'll close in prayer and we'll have some announcements. So what I'm saying is please don't run out of here. Because then we know we're going to have to pray for you. But take the time to hear from God. Let's. Pray. Get in a place ready to receive, however you're ready to receive from God. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here. I thank you that you've been speaking through the songs, through the, through the uh, prophetic acts that have taken place, and Lord, hopefully through my words too. You've been speaking to hearts, but now, Lord, we invite you to speak because your servants are listening. Speak to us now, Lord, and give us your life. Can we put on the next slide with the music, please? Rest. But we've been created to always be in your presence, to abide in you and have your word abide in us. So, Lord, I pray that if we need to repent, of anything that is hindering us. We would repent, confess and repent, confess and agree with you that it's sin and repent of that. Lord, if there's anything that so easily entangles us, it might not be sin, but it's just things that block us from making space to connect with you and be part of your vine and be connected to you. I pray that we'd be able to cast those off as well, Lord God. Put them in their proper place and realize, God, we have been created to be in your presence. And Lord, we can be in your presence 
every day as long as we want. I pray for impossible situations in health and in relationship and in finances and I speak life to those situations. And Lord, I thank you that you are going to prove yourself good once again and always. So Lord, I help us to trust and to grow in trust. In your precious name. Amen. Thank you for going there today. I know it's not a typical service, but man, we need more of this. I'll ask uh, Janine to come up. You've got the announcements or they'll be up on the screen.